All right, uh, it looks like we're recording. So hello, everybody. It's good to see um, all of our participants here. Um, this is the Living with Wildlife seminar series. My name is Katie Sartini, um, and I'm here with uh, Dr. Scott Hingstrom, who is another one of our instructors here in this, um, in this Living with Wildlife class. So for those of you who have not joined us before, um, this seminar series was basically born from us realizing that we have a lot of really uh, amazing guest speakers that we bring into class and we wanna be able to share uh, those speakers with the rest of our campus community. So we basically opened up our class today to allow um, other people in um, to learn from our speakers. And um, this uh, speaker that we have with us today is Kurt Minia, and I'm gonna let um, Scott introduce Kurt um, here in just a minute. Before we get started with our talk though, I just want to quickly acknowledge um, that uh, we, so I'm sorry, we're just gonna read this statement word for word. This is a statement that we've been asked to read whenever we gather, and we're gonna consider this to be a public gathering, even though it is a virtual public gathering. Um, so we recognize that the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point occupies lands of the Ho-Chunk and Menominee people. Please take a moment to acknowledge and honor the ancestral Ho-Chunk and Menominee land and the sacred land of all indigenous peoples. So with that, I'm going to let Scott tell us a little bit about Kurt, and then we're going to let Kurt take it away. Well, thank you, Katie. And it is my pleasure to be able to introduce to you Dr. Kurt Miney. Uh, Kurt is a gentleman and a scholar. Uh, we've been friends for over 30 years. <clears throat> we were graduate students together at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And you know, I always thought Kurt was one of uh, the, the, the wildlife graduate students, as I was. And he actually spent a lot more time in the library than any of us. Um, but it's because he was actually working on his PhD in history. And he was working on developing a, a dissertation that essentially was uh, the biography of, Al of Aldo Leopold. I have that book right here in hand. You can see the thickness of that baby. I mean, it is a monstrous effort that Kurt did for a PhD. And, and that was just one of the things that kind of kicked off his career. Since then, he's authored and edited several books. He's uh, made hundreds of presentations on ecology, on environmental justice, on um, uh, ecological awareness, on, on, on hundreds of different topics and, and fascinating areas. Um, Kurt has been the guide of Green Fire. And uh, most of you picked up the, the word that we would like you to have read Green Fire, and, oh, excuse me, read Thinking Like a Mountain and viewed the uh, Emmy Award winning film Green Fire before joining us in this uh, online session. So that way you can uh, get a little more out of the experience that, that you're involved with. Um, Kurt currently works as a senior fellow with the Aldo Leopold Foundation. He does wear many hats, but uh, I'll let him talk a little bit more about that. He's a main guitarist and folk singer, and uh, he works with the Aldo Leopold Foundation near Bear Blue, Wisconsin. With that, welcome, Kurt. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Scott. Thank you all. I'm unmuted. Good. If someone could put their thumbs up that they're hearing me okay. Very good, let's roll. Thank you, Scott, for that very nice introduction, my old pal. And uh, here we are meeting virtually all these years later, Scott. It's good to yeah. be with you. It's good to be with everyone. My best well wishes to one and all. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay alert. And uh, thanks for all you're doing in these difficult times. So um, I think I would actually like to begin. I'm going to put a little thing right away in, uh, in the messages here. I'm going to do this. There's a link. I'm just sending you a link. And I'm going to, that link, I'll show you what I am just shared with you. It goes along with the land acknowledgement. What you're seeing here is a new essay that I just had printed and pub uh, published uh, online through my colleagues at the Center for Humans and Nature. And I'm just going to leave this because this is my, my contribution to the acknowledgement. This is an essay um, about working with the Ho-Chunk Nation uh, here in my home landscape in Sauk County. I won't say much more about it. I invite you to read it. And, but it's my way of saying uh, my appreciation to the Ho-Chunk Nation, but more even than that, of working together with the nation on the land. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Um, the essay is there for you to read. I'm very pleased with this, not only because it's 
published, but because it was really done in partnership with the Ho-Chunk Nation. And in fact, the landscape it talks about is only 10 miles away from Aldo Leopold's shack. And there's a lesson in that, I think, for the future as well as for the present and helps us understand the history. So I'll leave it at that for now, but I encourage you all to uh, take a look at that. So I'll stop sharing that screen and I will start sharing, oops, start sharing another screen. Hold on here. Uh, let's see. Share screen, okay, let me get the other screen here. There we go, there we go. So, um, I altered my title a little bit while throwing this together um, in the last uh, few hours because um, I wanted to change the title a little bit. The subtitle of, for those of you who've seen the film, is A Land Ethic for Our Time. If you had a chance to watch the film Green Fire, um, or have seen it in the past, you'll recognize that as our subtitle. We chose it very purposefully to say that this is not just a historic history documentary. This is a film about the evolution of an idea that Leopold framed back at the end of his life, but that continues to grow and evolve. And the point of the whole film, in a sense, is that this is an idea that changes. And it's changing and they changed in Leopold's time and it's changing in years since, and it continues to. So um, I'm going to do this presentation, which I haven't done for a while. Green Fire premiered almost 10 years ago. It's hard to believe that for me. Um, and in the first few years after the film, I would do this present version, earlier version of this presentation to accompany the film to explore for, I would say, more academic audiences, the conceptual framework of that went into the film and helps us understand Leopold's contemporary relevance. Um, so in revisiting it for this, I actually shifted it a little bit. So we'll talk about that as I go along. But first, that um, we're taking the big picture here. This is my whole picture slide, right? It helps to uh, give us the perspective we need, especially these days to kind of rise above um, all that is in our way at the moment. And it, there's a lot in our way. Just so you know, I'm down here, I think you can see my cursor. I'm down here at the bend in the Wisconsin River um, where it turns west into the Driftless area. So I'm about hundred miles downstream from where many of you are right now. Perhaps you're scattered about. Um, so the big picture is what we're gonna look at. If you watched the film Green Fire, the very last line we use is Aldo Leopold's own, you know, his, some of his own final words. I'm not going to use, I only have two Leopold quotes in this whole presentation, here at the very beginning and then at the very end. But this is the one we conclude the film with, that Leopold wrote in, a, in the land ethic. I purposely presented the land ethic as a product of social evolution because nothing so important as an ethic is ever written. It evolves in the minds of a thinking community. And again, in the film, we comment on the irony of this statement that Leopold, in his own essay called The Land Ethic, makes a point that you can't write the land ethic. It is a collective expression of concern and care and love and respect. That's how Leopold understood his idea of an ethic and so I'm going to be talking mostly about how we may think about it in contemporary terms. And I'm going to do this by going through some of the faces and places that show up in our film. And even if you haven't seen Green Fire, uh, you don't have to know who all these people and all these places are because uh, it kind of tells the story itself. But if you watch the film, you'll recognize some of these faces and you'll see a much younger me now with a little darker hair and a beard. So I'm just gonna go through this real quickly, just as a reminder of people you met and voices you heard and places you saw in the film Green Fire. These are the faces and places we brought forward to help tell the story of Aldo Leopold and the land ethic. One of the most important was Scott Momaday a revered Native American writer, the first Native American writer to ever receive a Pulitzer Prize. 
still alive and well. God bless him. One of our great voices in American uh, culture and in Native American culture and a great voice for land ethics. We visited places like this, the Gila Wilderness, the first wilderness area in the United States. We visited well-known figures like Dave Foreman, the famous founder of Earth First, the rabid wilderness advocate, bit of a puppy, puppy dog, as you can tell from this picture. Uh, he has a reputation for being a very hard, hard driving conservationist. He's a, he has a different spirit when you're sitting with him. We visited ranch lands out west in the Southern Rockies primarily. This is the ranch of my friend Sid Goodlow. Most of these are pictures we took while we were filming. Uh, Sid Goodlow, a, a conservation rancher who's still quite active. He's 90 years old now. We visited, now so on that, you're going from wilderness lands, right? Wild places and wild land advocates to ranchers to our working landscapes and middle landscapes of the Midwest. Leopold Shack, of course, many of you have probably visited. And some of you who are a little older may remember meeting Aldo Leopold's daughter, Nina, a dear, dear friend and inspiration to so many of us who died just when the film was finished, actually. Um, this is actually an aerial phot photograph of the Wisconsin River, that yellow asterisk up there is where the Leopold Shack is. And I use this photo to illustrate that it's not a wild landscape. It is a landscape of embedded within typical Wisconsin mixed farmlands and woodlots, and pastures and river bottom and so forth. And there's the Wisconsin River by Leopold Shack. Here's my buddy George Archibald the founder of the International Crane Foundation in Baraboo, Wisconsin. Uh, I'm a research associate there still, and we work all over the world on different wetland areas from the most wild wetlands in the world to some of the most heavily affected by human impacts. In the film, we visit Western Wisconsin, the little town of Coon Valley out there next to La Crosse, just upstream, up watershed from the Mississippi River. And we talk, tell the story of the cooperative effort in the 1930s to rehabilitate this damaged landscape. There, in fact, we stopped and that's where we interviewed my friend Paul Johnson, a renowned conservationist from Iowa, who is a farmer and forester in his, in his life, but also spent time, a lot of time in government uh, leading important work on private land conservation. We visited other landscapes, suburban landscapes. If you watch the film, you may have seen a short visit we made to this little prairie embedded in the suburban landscape of Chicago, near where I grew up actually, and where a very active prairie restoration community goes out every weekend. Every weekend in the year, there's people out doing prairie restoration in the suburbs and in the city limits of Chicago. We visit cities and towns. Burlington, Iowa, Leopold's hometown on the Mississippi River. Larger towns like Santa Fe, New Mexico, where Leopold and his wife met and were married. That's uh, Estella Leopold's childhood home in Santa Fe. We visit Madison, Wisconsin, of course, where Aldo Leopold spent the latter part of his career and life at the University in Madison. We go to big cities like Chicago, where I Spent a lot of time, of course, growing up myself. We visit some wonderfully amazing people along the way. We visit this little nature center on the south side of Chicago, a little oasis, green oasis on the south side where my friend Michael Howard, just talked to Michael a couple weeks ago, um, 10 years after doing the film. We stay in touch. He's a good friend and a hero of mine doing amazing work in this a uh, challenged community in South Side of Chicago. And then a couple last ones. Early in the film, there's just a little snippet here, but we went to visit my friend Carl Safina, who is a well-known writer and leading marine uh, ocean conservationist working out of Long Island. And so it's a reminder about the world below us, the oceans. And then this is my compliment slide of looking up above to the skies, the atmosphere, the big sky out in the 
along the border in uh, New Mexico and Arizona and Mexico. So oceans and skies. Why do I use this whole sequence of slides? Well, it's to basically ask, what do all these people have in common? These faces and voices we use to tell the story that we ask to share their story with us. What do they have in common? And these places from some of the most wild places in the continental US, to some of the most urbanized, what do they have in common? What do we share? How can we even weave together this fabric of a story from the, such a diversity of base voices and places? So that sets the stage for kind of where I want to go with this. Well, when we sat down to think about doing the film, I was not going to be the narrator. You see me on screen if you watch the film a lot. Um, that was not the original intent. I was going to be just helping out as a writer and reviewer and all that, but I ended up getting pulled into the film. And I said, all right, if I'm going to do this, it's going to have to kind of share some of my own ways of understanding how the story goes. And one day I sat down in a restaurant with one of the fellows who was helping us develop the, you know, sort of the plot line for the documentary. And I said, we have to tell this story in a way that reflects Leopold's breadth and the relevance of the land ethic today and going forward into the future. That it isn't just about wilderness. And it's not even just about agricultural landscapes and working lands. It's about the entirety of the landscape from our most urbanized places to our most wild places because that reflects a reality about Alden Leopold, and I symbolize it in this slide. There's only one figure in the history of American conservation who has a Center for Sustainable Agriculture named after him and a Wilderness and Wilderness Research Institute named after him. Why is that important? Well, first of all, just a reminder, Leopold did work and for protection of wildlands from the earliest part of his career to the very end of his life. And part of his legacy is this commitment to protecting the wildest landscapes that we still have in our world. This was a commitment of him personally, professionally, and in his literary world too, his life too, constantly writing about the value of wilderness for so many different values. Um, from recreational to cultural and historical to biodiversity and wildlife, and even spiritual values. He was committed to protecting wildlands. And he did this work um, in every capacity you can imagine, from scientist to advocate to teacher to administrator. But Leopold was also equally and passionately devoted to improving the sustainability and uh, uh, our working lands. And especially after he moved back to the Midwest, his passion for improving the way we take care of the lands we need to produce our livelihoods, our goods and services was equally strong. And he wrote as much about that as he did about wilderness. Here's just a sample again of some of his writings on the theme. And again, meeting with people, not just in offices, but out on the farmscapes of Wisconsin and beyond. Leopold was devoted to working with the landowner, landowners, uh, landowners in a whole watersheds and landscapes. He was committed to this as much as anything in his conservation career. And even beyond that, when he moved back to Wisconsin in 1924, he was living here in the city, in Madison. He was an urban dweller. And there's uh, what and Madison looked like, the university campus in Madison looked like in about Leopold's time, the 20s and 30s, looking toward the state capitol there down University Avenue. And in fact, it was in Madison that he helped develop the University of Wisconsin Arboretum, um, famous as the birthplace, if you will, of ecological restoration. And why is that important? Because with that, Leopold is starting a whole new branch of conservation, if you will. If John Muir and the early conservation movement was all about protection of wildlands 
And Gifford Pinchot and other early foresters are all about sustainable forestry and agriculture and such. This was a third wave, ecological restoration, um, beginning in the 1930s in Madison, Wisconsin. So the big picture again, looking out over our landscapes, we ask the question, what does conservation mean now going forward? What does it mean in our times, especially in these challenging moments of our lives, but looking ahead to future decades and generations, what will conservation look like? What has to look like? Is Leopold even relevant to where we need to go? Well, I'm gonna argue that he, of course, was and is still as significant, in fact, in some ways more significant now going forward than he has been in the past because of the relevance of the land ethic across the landscape, the title, subtitle of my talk here. So if you look back to the film Green Fire, you see we didn't have to try hard to frame it this way because there are people all across the landscape who love the places they live and are devoted to making them healthier and more resilient and more sustainable, whatever terms we want to use now. Um, they are devoted to conservation where they live. And it doesn't matter if you live in the most wild place or in the most urbanized place. And this is more than relevant than ever. Here's, a, I flashed this up just to show you. I gave a talk way back now, 15 years ago almost, um, about the challenge of working from the urban part of our landscape to the rural. Bridging the urban rural divide, oh my gosh, 2006. Because in the conservation world, at least some folks were already beginning to be concerned about the growing divide between urban and rural America. So I'm a little, just going to do a little, uh, a little detour here for a few slides to talk about that, about how the world has changed since Leopold's time. If you look here, Leopold was uh, living and working in the time when America became more and more urban. And the conservation movement he knew was based in rural America. The environmental movement comes along back in the 70s with more of a suburban suburbs. But the majority of Americans now live in more suburban landscapes or exurban landscapes. So the land conservation is changing. If I froze up there, I apologize. Sometimes I may freeze uh, with my sometimes bulky internet connection. This theme of the urban rural divide really burst on to public consciousness after the 2016 election when we began to realize that this had political ramifications. Um, the divide between uh, the blue urban, mostly urban, not exclusively, but mostly urban voters and the rural red voters. This has now become so common, it's taken for granted, but for many years, this was overlooked. But after that election, after four years ago, after the last presidential election, we began to see headlines like this. We began to be much more conscious of the urban rural divide and the differences in our body politic. And, you know, more and more, political scientists and others began to focus on something that we in the conservation world had been thinking about a lot already. But we've become increasingly polarized, not only politically, but geographically. And if you're curious, this is the la latest map that I could find on the results from just two weeks ago. We are purple, but we have bluer and redder zones, of course. And any red state has blue cities and any blue state has red countryside. And years ago, I remember talking, giving talks on this theme and saying, if we do not, if we do not reconstitute the common ground, our democracy is going to fail. I was blunt about it back then, and I can be as blunt about it back now. If, unless we collectively find ways to overcome the rural urban divide, we are facing a tragic situation going ahead. And it's tragic for conservation because we cannot conserve one part of the landscape. And that's where I want to go with basically the rest of this talk. 
So the truth is, of course, that there's no such thing as pure wilderness and there's no such thing as pure urbanized landscapes either. We all exist on a continuum from lands that have been deeply affected by the human footprint to those that are less affected. This is an older study done by the Wildlife Conservation Society. Oh gosh, going back almost 20 years ago now. Here's, a, But you get an idea of this uh, continuum from most to least influence on our landscape, right? Here's a little more updated version of this, a little more sophisticated version. And it also brings in the temporal dimension up there on top, showing that this is a trend that landscapes change um, as, as time goes on and history and human activity changes. So we can look at how we become more urbanized and have seen a loss of the quote wild part of the spectrum. There's obviously a lot more to say about this, but I want to just kind of drive home the main message. We can talk more if you want to about some of the details, but here is the framework I sketched out literally on a napkin, literally, uh, when we were thinking about doing the film Green Fire. I said to my colleague, if in this film we can help address this issue, I'm aboard. I'll be your narrator. But we have to show how the land ethic and conservation in general is relevant from uh, our, our urban parts of our landscape to our most rural. And of course, here's what I said to him in a nutshell, that we need to move from thinking about an urban rural divide to recognizing that we all live along a continuum from urban to wild. And that within that spectrum there's all kinds of fine variations right i'm just going to punch them up here you know we have small cities and small towns we have suburbs that are ringing the cities we have all kinds of different working lands our wild lands we call them lots of different things protected areas and wildlife refuges reserves nature conservancy lands so many different types of uh, more wild parts of our landscape the schmeekly reserve let's think of that as a bit of wildland in your urban landscape of, of uh, Stevens Point. But so we go to land use continuum and then we think back to especially post-World War II history. After World War II, what happened? After Leopold's death in 1948, what happened? We created the suburbs. We kept expanding the suburbs, kept moving outward. You know, we built the automobile culture. We surrounded and fragmented our wild lands. And this was basically the world I grew up in. This was the post-World War II world, up until actually about the time we made the film. The Great Recession of 2008 and 2009 uh, really was put a break to this in some ways, didn't it? When we all look back on that, or if you're a student, if you were just a kid at the time, but. This, it did, it, it started to reshape this. And in fact, there's been an influx into the cities again, especially among younger people over the last decade. And now COVID-19 has really kind of turned things upside down, hasn't it? But this was the trend that gave rise to the environmental movement and its ways of thinking about land use. But what we do, of course, is have to change these trends and loops, these feedback loops to this. We have to reconnect ourselves along the spectrum, across the landscape. We have to see the connections and build resilience into them. We have to transform the feedback loops to build land health, resilience, and sustainability into the whole landscape. That's our mission. I used to, So I used this for talks a while back. And then a few years back, I said, I need to add more. I need to add this. All too, uh, all too current, I'm afraid, at the moment as we sit here um, with the latest Category 5 hurricane slamming into Central America right now. So climate change, the atmospheric commons that is above all of us. And the, atmosphere, the, the atmospheric commons matched by the oceanic commons, the marine world below us. So the two great commons we share the oceans and the atmosphere have to be part of this scenario as well, because 
there's no such thing as a sustainable city or suburb or small town or farm or natural area or wildlife population, call it like you will, in a landscape or a world that is unsustainable. If the whole thing is not sustainable, none of the parts will be. So what does that look like? Um, just got a few more slides here. So start thinking questions or discussion points here. I just want to illustrate this very briefly. I could do a whole nother lecture just on this, but thinking about this end of the spectrum, the wildlands, we think about wildlands differently now than we did even when Scott and I were students holed up in the basement of our offices in Madison, Wisconsin. It was about that time that the Yellowstone fires, for those of you of an age, you'll remember this mark summer of 1988 when Yellowstone burned and woke people up to the fact that fire is a natural process, a natural agent of disturbance. But we have to understand how fire works. Landscapes and protected places are not immune to change. They are, in fact, dynamic places. We use fire now. We recognize, as Leopold did, that it's a tool. And it's one we have to understand, especially given what has happened in the last few summers um, with fire in the American West. Or a little closer to home here, on this, just to choose one more example. We now know that flooding is not a disturbance. Flooding is a natural agent of change in riverine systems, just to give an example. So we think about protected areas, wildlands, in a different way now. We understand their dynamism and the human role within them. Our rural landscapes, we understand that if we're going to sustain our rural landscapes, we have to rethink the way we do agriculture and forestry. Um, we have to rethink the way we manage our working lands. Out in the Southwest, where I've done a lot of work, this is right along the Mexico border. In fact, yeah, here's the border wall going up, fragmenting the landscape that I've worked in down there that Leopold knew as well. So our working ranch lands or in the US and in, in um, Wisconsin, it may be this. It may be trying to understand how we're going to sustain our farming world, our traditions, but how those traditions may have to adapt and change under new circumstances, economic, environmental, social. And we're seeing those changes happening. Uh, Wisconsin, we have a lot of examples. We could do a whole lecture just on alternative scenarios for the future of agriculture. Organic highlighted here is just one of them, but um, it's happening everywhere. Um, but Wisconsin is a uh, hot spot. How about the suburbs? Oh my gosh, suburbs. Those post-World War II suburbs? Well, they kind of can't go on forever, right? We all knew this even as it was happening. We reached that breaking point 10 years ago. They still get built. They still sprawl out there. But increasingly, we see innovation. How can we design our built environment? This is a development on the far north fringe of Chicago, just south of the Wisconsin border, actually, um, a place I got familiar with when I, I came to know the landscape and the designers of this place. And when this was built, this is back in the 90s. Look at this. It made literally made headlines all over the country, developing a suburb with principles, with ideas, that is, of sustainability guiding them. And then on the urban end, Chicago, here's Chicago, filming in Chicago, remember? Yeah, we were out there. Look, this is a product of the Chicago wilderness, um, the consortium of conservation organizations in the Chicago area, one of the largest cities, of course, in North America, probably the most vital city for conservation in the world, in my view. But isn't this a different way of thinking about cities, of seeing the green infrastructure that supports them? but also which cities affect and how can we rethink our cities so that we work in harmony with the landscape that contains them. Even Stevens Point, I shouldn't say even, um, Stevens Point has a tradition of this. I just scrolled around on Google and found a couple things just before putting this together. 2008, that's 12 years ago. Hope someone there can tell me more about how the path to a sustainable Stevens Point has gone forward, whether anything came out of that effort. But every city has opportunities now to rethink itself. And this is going to be happening, I predict, big time 
as the pandemic hopefully begins to release its grip on all of us. We have to rethink our urban environments along with every other. So I'm coming to the end here to pull it all together, to think about where you can fit in if you're a student, especially how we plug into this large overview of conservation as we go forward. Whether it's at the urban end or the wildland end or anything in the middle, whether it's dealing with local food or dealing with design, dealing with agriculture in cities, dealing with watersheds, there's a place to plug in, no matter what your interest, your profession, your specialty, your discipline, because we're gonna need it all. We're gonna need it all across the landscape. We're gonna need all these approaches that make connection across the landscape and build resilience into the whole scenario. Because, and this is kind of my take home couple messages here, something is sustainable when it contributes to healthier and more resilient connections across the landscape. And if it undermines those connections and relationships, it's not sustainable. That's why the urban rural divide is such a tragic thing because it's undermining the reality of our connectivity as a society, but also as an ecological reality on the landscape. We're connected by water and watersheds, just to name a few of the things that do connect us. Um, I'm 100 miles downstream from you. So I'm connected to uh, Stevens Point by the Wisconsin River that flows right outside my uh, front lawn here. We're connected by the great watershed of the Mississippi River, if we want to think of it that way. And so we're connected to the oceans. We're connected to the dead zone of the Gulf of Mexico. We're connected to what's going on in Central America with the hurricane right now. We're connected by food across the landscape. And the food movement in the last 15 years or so has been one of the great driving forces in these shifts. We're connected by wildlife and wildlife movements and migrations and species ranges, just to choose one example of flyways. All these things connect us across the landscape from the ecological uh, characteristics and the atmosphere and water and food and wildlife to more of the social end of things. But we're also connected culturally and spiritually by our history, by our stories, by, in fact, our shared future. So we can dwell on those things that divide us, but we all dwell within landscapes that connect us. To me, that is the core take home message that lives with the land ethic. The land ethic is an expression of concern for the land, but also for human connections on the land. So I'm gonna leave you with two last slides. One is just to show what a positive you can. This is just a small group of people. This is a little tag group of folks that uh, I work with. We call ourselves the Rural Urban Flow. Um, we had a meeting at the Leopold Center. These are folks from Milwaukee and from Sauk County, Wisconsin. We just decided, let's just try to make some connection. Let's try to do what uh, we could to counter the trends and the actual manufacturing of the divisions in our culture. Because I do believe that there's a lot of power and money put into keeping us divided. So we bring together these people and it's a growing group now. We have regular calls. If you're interested, just check out ruralurbanflow.org. But we're taking the lead. We're not gonna wait because frankly, we can't wait for people who are in positions of power and authority to do this. We can't wait. We have to make these connections any way we can. So I'll leave you with this. This is another line of Leopold's. It shows up in Green Fire. It's the second quote, the last one. There are two things that interest me, the relation of people to each other and the relation of people to land. Conservation is, we've traditionally focused on that uh, last part, people to land, but we also know more than ever that we need to be focusing as much on the relation of people to one another. Whether it's recognition of Ho-Chunk and Menominee history and culture in our landscapes, recognizing that conservation and diversity have to be connected more vitally. This is a land ethic going forward. And so I hope the film brought that forward 
We tried to do that 10 years ago when we made it. We couldn't predict what would happen, but I'm pleased to see that it holds up fairly well. I think it does. Um, and we did our best to try to illustrate those trends, but still living and learning because that is the land ethic evolving. And the last thing I'll say is the last thing you said in the film, that it's up to all of us. We are all writing the land ethic. Leopold did not write the land ethic. You and I write the land ethic every time we speak of it, every time we try to figure it out, explore its complexity, and realize what it means for us all going forward. There we be. <laughs> Awesome. Oh, I took longer than I anticipated. I apologize for that. Not, not a problem at all, Kurt. I really appreciate that. I, I think, um, well, I don't know. This is the kind of thing I could, I could listen to you talk about this all, all the time, I think, because it's, it always feels so inspiring to me. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, we do have, uh, a few minutes for questions, guys. It's 4.42. The seminar officially ends at 4.50, but we can go um, as long as people want to stay, as long as Kurt is willing to stay with us, I guess. I'm more um, than happy. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think we've got enough interest to keep you busy for a little bit. So um, we've had a couple questions chatted in already. Yeah. Um, so would you like me to uh, to read those out? Or how would you like to handle the questions? You want to um, I can read them. I'll, I'll, I'll save you the trouble. Um, well, let's just take them one by one. All right. Uh, my friend Scott starts it off by asking, it's been 30 years since I wrote the biography of Leopold. Indeed it does. And 10 years since <laughs> we made the film. How's my perspective on it changed in this time? Oh my gosh. Uh, it changes constantly. Um, that is what keeps Leopold fresh and vital for all these years for me personally. I think it is what keeps him fresh and vital for many readers. But it also raises questions. There's been a lively discussion over the last few years about Leopold and social justice, for example. And I could go on and on about that theme. The fact that Leopold married into an Hispanic family, for example. What was his view on Native American life and culture? I could, you know, those are big topics. I can't go into them right now. But those social dimensions of the land ethic now are more prominent than they've ever been. And um, I have long had these conversations, but now I'm finding I need to be much more uh, active in exploring those. Um, I'd say my own, in, in short, my perspective has changed with that last point I said. That when I was first exploring Leopold and the concept of the land ethic, I did think of it in terms of, quote, Leopold's land ethic. <laughs> you'll see that phrase all the time. I hope you'll never see me use that phrase because it's not Leopold's land ethic. The Menominee have a land ethic. The Menominee Nation's land ethic is 5,000 years old, at least. The Ho-Chunk Nation has a land ethic. The African-American experience has given Black culture a different kind of a land we have many cultures, we have many backgrounds, and the land ethic to me now is this. It's this coming together of shared values that we have to take time to listen to one another to explore and understand. So I think of it actually ironically as much more vital and alive than it's ever been because it also has to reach up and out. It is no longer just the intimate land ethic of, oh, if I take care of my own 40 acres or my own city neighborhood, we have to be thinking about the earth ethic. As Jane Lubchenco says in the film, we need to be thinking about the earth and our relationship to it as a whole, even as we care about our local landscapes. So it's larger spatial scales, longer time scales, and those cultural and social dimensions. So all of this means a really complex and rich coming together of ideas that are gonna to help to get us through the crises we face right now. Speaking of crises, the second question is, Leopold's life during the Spanish flu pandemic. Do you know roughly what the urban rural divide was like during the flu? That's a great, wow, what a question. Leopold did live through the, the uh, pandemic in 1917, 18, 19. Um, he was living in Santa Fe, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and he was affected by it, not directly personally, but certainly it was a disruption to life. Even what was then kind of a remote area 
by modern standards of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, that's actually when Leopold left the Forest Service because it was also World War I, of course. Um, so um, Leopold's life was uncertain, very uncertain <laughs> uh, due to the global uh, at, at the pandemic, but also global conflict for the first time in history. So there's a lesson for that saying he would repeat that, of course, after World War II with economic depression thrown into the mix. So if there's a message for us is that Leopold, like people of all people of his generation, lived through tumultuous uncertainty as we are right now. And so there are lessons from that history that we can, I think, take and build on. Um, the urban rural divide, yeah, it was just in those years, the late teens and into the early 20s when America was becoming more urban. Leopold went, was arguing for protecting wilderness, not because he had this, this romantic idea of a pristine wild place, is because automobiles were coming on the landscape. In the late teens and early 20s, we become a motorized nation. That's why he was arguing for protection of wilderness. So by 1925, America was more urban for the first time in its history. That was about the year that we switched to being mostly rural to 50.1% urban. Uh, have you noticed more civil engineers working on keeping wildlife corridors open and protected in the recent past and before? It seems that for every green bridge I've seen, there are many more clear cuts. But are there other innovations you're aware of? Oh boy, that's another great question. I used to teach en uh, engineering students a lot when I was in grad school, actually. Um, it's a long story, but uh, uh, so I have a lot, and my, my, my oldest brother is actually an engineer too. And so he and I've had a lot of conversations along these lines over the years. Um, I am so impressed with how much more ecologically aware engineers are now than they used to be. And let's say it the other way too, that those of us who come from the natural sciences, I think we understand more the need to engage with people working with the built environment, working with obviously technology, we can't avoid it obviously, but we understand more that it's gonna take a marriage of technology and ethics and so much more to get us through all this. And so, yeah, I do see, yeah, I wish I could say it was all the time, I can name all kinds of highway projects and other things that I see on a daily basis that uh, don't give me a lot of optimism. But I can also see a lot of wonderful projects where you do see ecological wisdom coming together with technological know-how. Um, so yeah, how is the prairie in the rural area of Chicago started? Uh, boy, that embedded prairie, it's a great story. Uh, I'll try to make it short. Um, that prairie, that, that little postage stamp prairie in the suburbs of Chicago, uh, that one was protected because a, I hate to say the word, but a classic housewife, suburban housewife in the 60s, heard a lecture by a University of Wisconsin professor. Scott will know the name. Some of you of an age will know the name, Hugh Iltis the renowned and incorrigible <laughs> biodiversity advocate gave a lecture in the 1960s on why we should care about prairies. This woman heard it and she went to work preserving that little prairie. She now lives in Wisconsin, actually. She must be in her 90s now, but I, I got in touch with her. The prairies that are around Chicago and that are being restored that's a legacy of the movement in the early 20th century to protect the forest preserves. All of you have driven in and around Chicago probably at some point or flown in and out of O'Hare Airport and you see the green necklace. Well, it used to be a necklace around Chicago. Now it's kind of embedded within the urban area of Chicago. But it was those, that movement to protect forest preserves that managed to protect actually the best remaining prairies in Illinois. What? The Prairie State. Why are they in, all in and around Chicago? Because everything else got plowed up. It was the fact that Chicago, the visionaries decided we have to protect that fringe zone around Chicago. And those happened to be unplowed prairie. So amazingly enough, uh, they were able to protect them. And then later on, two generations later, three generations, 
we understood that you can't just simply protect things by putting a boundary line around them. You have to be actively maintaining and restoring them. It's a great story. There's a lot written about that. I'm going to take a sip here. Coon Valley. Has Coon Valley stayed committed to conservation? Indeed, I recommend all of you, if you have a chance to take field trips out to Coon Valley and get the history, you can help set that up if you'd like to do that when we can do the gatherings again. Um, yeah, there is still a legacy of uh, land care and stewardship in, in that region. Um, there has to be because of the physical characteristics of the landscape, it's so highly ero erosion prone. So you still see a lot of the same features. Of course, those of you who are fisher people will know that it's amazingly important trout fishing out there as the stream beds have recovered and the base flow of the groundwater has recharged the streams and the trout have recovered. At the same time, the agricultural and market pressures are strong. Uh, the movement toward corn and soy, let's just be blunt about it, um, the economic pressures to just go corn and soy, even in the convoluted driftless area of Wisconsin, makes it really hard. And so there are challenges now and all, on top of all the other challenges of the economics of dairying and small dairying. But again, there's good and bad. The good side is that's also near the home of Organic Valley. And by going organic, a lot of farmers, small and mid-sized farmers have been able to hold on and make a, not just a go of it, but to make a good life for themselves by adopting other techniques than going to the conventional larger scale, ever larger production, which means, of course, falling prices, getting off that treadmill of production. Ah, OK, I got a few more here if you want to hang on a few more minutes. I know uh, you said we're almost done, but I'm willing to stay on and do the next three <laughs> questions. Okay. Positive trends in younger generations, like these students taking more time and thought, the topic of sustainability more conscientious of our impact on the land in general. Do you anticipate the extended thought stops with this generation? Oh my. I do indeed see positive trends. Um, well, I'll say a couple things. One, I mentioned the food movement just as an example. When I give this lecture, I often will say to the students, I said, you know, just ask your parents and ask if you eat better in your dorm or in your student union than their, your parents did. And I guarantee you, you eat better. <laughs> the food is better. The food is healthier. Why is that? It's not because the president of the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point said, oh, we have to give better food to our students. No, I guarantee you that's not what happened. It happened because students rose up and said, starting 15, 20 years ago, mm -hmm care about in our health. The movements were more regional. Um, I also say often to students, um, uh oh, I may have frozen up there again, uh, but I often say to students, where is the leadership going to come from here? Um, the leadership is not going to come from above. Um, the leadership is coming from and always will come from below. I am more convinced of that than the first time I said that in public many years ago. Often what I'll say, if, I'm, if we were together in a room at Stevens Point, I'd say, look to the person next to you, because that's the leader. And I mean that sincerely. The leadership is not above. It's not in positions of power and authority. And never confuse leadership with power and authority. That's not leadership. <laughs> <laughs> so look to the person in the Zoom box next to you. Look to the name in the Zoom box next to you. That's the leadership right there. You are it, and I have utter faith that young people will be the leaders and are already assuming that, especially under these conditions. The pandemic is throwing everything up in the air. Where it lands, how it lands, and when it lands is going to be up to all of us. But more than anybody, it's going to be up to you, young folks. So go to it. Do not wait. Do not wait for permission. Go forth and find where you plug in. That's why I use that one slide. 
doesn't mean you have to be a full-time working professional wildlife biologist or forester or farmer or whatever. It just means whatever you do in your life, there's a place to plug in. Um, what do you think is the best message for students to reduce the impact? Any messages for dealing with political parallels? Wow. Um, well, sort of what I just said in a way. <laughs> um, yeah, um, don't wait, it again is the message. Um, that group that I showed you, that little slide about the rural urban flow, that's just a small group of people saying, let's talk to each other, let's get to know each other, let's explore each other's stories, let's, let's have some food together, let's eat, <laughs> let's drink, um, <laughs> let's make music, let's understand our landscapes. So start small because that's as important as anything. If you have friends or neighbors or family in cities and you're experiencing a different rural place, help them understand it and vice versa. You know, it's, we have to somehow withdraw the wedges that have been driven in. These wedges have been driven in between us for so long, we don't even know anymore how to, how to communicate with each other. We have to extract those wedges. So, uh, yeah, go for it. And uh, the political parallels resist the urge to be divided. You know, the easiest thing in the world for a politician to do is divide us. It's the easiest thing to do. The hardest thing to do is to bring people together to solve problems. So that's what the leadership vacuum is right now. And we all have to be those leaders. Hueltus in the Conservation Hall of Fame, indeed, with Christine Thomas. <laughs> I remember, I remember that. Oh, I love this, Sophia. Let's all look to the name next to us. I'm going to punch mine in. Let's see. I'm next to Jay Summers. There, Jay, you are now, you are now deputized. <laughs> oh, come on. You're a leader. <laughs> I can't um, take this pressure. <laughs> Last thoughts. Any thoughts on Wisconsin? Relatively new organization called Green Fire. That's a great one to end up on. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, boy, um, I was sort of helped start Green Fire. I, I haven't been nearly as active as many of my own friends and colleagues have been. But uh, the first first annual meeting of Green Fire was, in fact, held at the Aldo Leopold Center. And it was, in fact, going back to the earlier questions, it was an effort by many professionals, especially retired Wisconsin DNR colleagues, to say, enough. We have to be able to come together. We have to bring science back into policy making. We have to use science in a respectful way. We have to be able to call upon our citizens and our professionals to stand up for the values that we in Wisconsin used to think would never leave us. We in Wisconsin used to brag on ourselves all the time about being great leaders nationally in conservation. Well, we lost that if we're frank and honest with ourselves. And I believe we have to be frank and honest with ourselves yeah. if we're ever gonna be reclaiming that mantle. So um, when Green, Wisconsin's Green Fire came together now about four or five years ago, it was to give a voice again to the role of science and decision making, but also to the idea that science serves the public interest. To remind ourselves that the work we do, especially for this group here, as students, as scientists, as university faculty, that the great tradition of Wisconsin is that we serve, we serve the people, we serve the land. That is what made Wisconsin a leader in our history. That is what it's gonna to take to make us a leader again. And all of you are, again, already, I've said it five times now, you are already leaders, just I think by sharing your time here this afternoon. So um, please go forward. If you're interested in Green Fire, I should do a little plug, just go to, I think it's uh, wisconsingreenfire.org. Yes. I encourage you, thank you, Scott. Look into it and invite future speakers, especially our good friend Fred Clark, who's the current director mm -hmm. of uh, Green Fire. I know he would drop anything to come and speak to you, all of you, uh, about how you can be involved. 
And here's a last toast to your health. <laughs> to you all, thank you for spending time. Well, thank you, Kurt, for your words of wisdom here today. Um, Katie and I have been assigning many readings out of Leopold's uh, a Sand County Almanac. And I, I think some of the students came here thinking, oh, we're going to have to listen to more words about uh, green fire dying, the wolf size, et cetera. Well, I think they got a lot more than that. <laughs> well, it, it's, you know, that remember, I showed the picture of Scott Momaday. Read Scott Momaday if you don't know his work. Just an amazing voice. And he's the one in the film who says, I think we all have the essence of green fire within us, right? And that is the take home message. The green fire is not something that happened historically. It is that thing we all feel within ourselves that devotes us to this work. So carry it on. That's terrific, Kurt. Thanks for your time. And uh, we hope to have you back again some other time. Hope to see you all. Soon, healthy. <laughs>